Good morning, everybody. I'm very pleased and interested to be here. It's a little intimidating, uh, sort of representing the entire medical community. Um, <clears throat> but, um, you know, we'll do the best we can. I really want to thank uh, Naomi Fukugawa back there and Steve Schaefer. Uh, they've sort of planted me in the soil, and um, it'll be, we'll see at the end of this half hour if I've germinated, flowered, grown, whatever. You all will be the, uh, the judge of that. <clears throat> so um, we have some uh, objectives. I want to um, get a chance to talk about some areas where I think uh, there's overlap between soil science and, um, and human health, and hopefully you'll be able to uh, you know, go along and participate in the discussion uh, both after my talk and for the rest of today and tomorrow. Um, so um, I think you're all familiar with this definition of um, soil health and uh, tell me now if this is not a, a widely accepted definition um, and because it's the one I'm going to be uh, using today. So um, somebody representing the you know entire human health community, um, maybe it's incumbent upon me to give you some thoughts about well, how do you define human health? Um, and thankfully, I don't have to do that. Um, the World Health uh, Organization has done that. And um, this is a definition that they promulgated uh, in the 40s, when the 1940s, when they were founded. And it's a fairly radical um, definition of health because it includes mental and social well-being and the phrase that says not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And so I think that's um, something that even many health practitioners in the United States today would have trouble grappling with. Um, uh, you know, on the one hand, this is a definition from the World Health Organization, but is it, is it the definition that every health professional carries in her or his mind on an every um, single ba day basis? I don't know. Um, if you look at the original definition, there's absolutely nothing that you would think might be a link to the environment or soil health or anything like that. Now. Uh, much more recently, they've come up um, with a sort of an addendum to that original definition. And their broader definition does encompass other species, our ecosystem, and the integral ecological underpinnings of many drivers or protectors of health risk. And when you use that broad a definition of human health, I think there is very much room for the discussions that we're going to be having today and tomorrow. This is a very um, traditional, uh, and it's the original definition of public health. Um, the language is early 20th century, um, but it's really very similar uh, to the definition that you'll find today on the website for the American Public Health Association or for the Centers for Disease Control. And, you know, very little here, I think, where you could find words that you could incorporate the notion of the human environment, the microbiome, soil science, et cetera. Um, but that's, that's human, that's public health. I think that um, medicine as it's currently practiced um, and this is a, a biased, jaundiced um, personal view, but um, uh, leaves very little room for public health, the environment, or other expansive um, concepts. Um, it's the notion 
that people are broken because they're sick, they have an illness, and they need to be fixed. Um, and I have found throughout my career as a teacher um, in schools of medicine and in schools of public health um, that it's a real effort to convince physicians to move out of the confines of their office or their hospital um, and to engage in broader issues like climate change, gun violence, vaccine denial, all sorts of things that are transdisciplinary um, and um, break down the traditional silos that we all work in. Um, there is a notion of um, preventive health that um, uh, people talk about, and one can even become a board certified specialist in preventive medicine. Um, but again, relatively little link um, with uh, what's the what are the concepts within soil health. Now, I think a lot of you have heard the term global health. Um, and in its very expansive definition there at the top of the slide, which you know, takes about seven minutes to read the, the very convoluted language, um, again, um, on the one hand, I think those of us in this room know that if we're going to improve the health of the people worldwide, worldwide um, you know, we need to feed them well. Uh, we need to sequester carbon effectively and efficiently. And those are all parts of soil science. Um, and global health is supposed to involve many disciplines within and beyond the health sciences. <clears throat> and so I think there may be room in the global health tent uh, for some of the discussions that we're going to have um, today and tomorrow and beyond. Um, but I want to um, bring you this n very new notion of um, planetary health, because this one um, can certainly encompass many topics, um, including uh, soil health, I think. The leadership of planetary health comes from a Rockefeller Commission Lancet, um, Rockefeller Foundation Lancet Commission on Planetary Health, and it was only convened for the first time in 2015. So this is a very new um, concept, but I think it's a concept that you all may want to embrace and um, work within as you try and bridge um, the silos. Uh, there is a Planetary Health Alliance that's a consortium of universities and NGOs, um, and they're trying to uh, address um, the, the human health impacts of anthropogenic changes on the Earth's natural systems. And I think that very much speaks to um, what we're all about here today. Um, for those of you who are researchers um, and are looking for a place to publish your research, um, there is an open access online only journal um, called Lancet Planetary Health. And um, you, know, you can get on their emailing list and uh, get the, um, the contents of uh, the journal every month on your, uh, in your inbox. So, um, I also, uh, you know, think that um, there's a lot to be uh, considered in terms of human activity and the impact of human activity on soils. And, um, you know, uh, it's not just what soils do to humans, but it's very much what humans also due to soils, and how are those activities influencing the global burden of disease? I've certainly learned over the months that I've had to prepare for this conference that um, you know, soil health is very much inextricably linked with 
the global burden of disease, but I wouldn't imagine that many physicians um, think about this. You may have also heard of the concept of One Health um, that talks about people, animals, and the environment. And so the question would be, do plants and soils get subsumed in that term environment? One Health is uh, uh, more of an outgrowth of um, perhaps the veterinary medicine uh, field than, um, than it is necessarily the, the human health field. Do we have any veterinary medicine folks uh, here in the room today? Okay, well, we got one. That's, you, you represent the whole world of veterinary health. Okay. Um, there's another concept called eco-health that talks about the interactions between people, social and economic conditions, culture, and the natural environment. And so there I think there's very much um, room for soils, but I don't know that the eco-health people um, have ever thought about what they really could encompass in the work that they're doing. And um, there's a lot of overlap between the concepts of eco-health and one health, and whether they're the same or different, I'll you know, leave that to uh, the people who espouse these ideas, because I really want you, I think the best place for you to focus um, is in planetary health, and planetary health, I think, encompasses both eco-health and one health, whether they're one and the same thing or not. Um, so I want to give you some sense of um, the scale of thinking about these topics. And I really have to um, compliment uh, uh, Dr. Maria Sima, who's at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health for this image. So the yellow dots are the numbers of publications about public health um, in each 20-year block of time that, um, that, those little, that those round uh, circles represent. And the numbers aren't so important. I just want you to see the scale um, of the dots. And unfortunately, I can't quite read the, um, the legend from here, but um, to talk about how new planetary health is, it's that little tiny dot um, on the far right of the biggest dot on the screen. So it's a new concept, but I think it's a concept um, that can be a home for, for what we're talking about here. So again, I, I want to emphasize that I've, I've talked about these issues, and um, if you're really trying to engage the health community, um, there's a lot of work to be done here, um, because I don't know how many physicians are actively thinking about these things. If I can give you an example from my own professional society, the American Academy of Pediatrics. We've got 67,000 members of the American Academy of Pediatrics. There's a council on environmental health that has existed in one form or another within the American Academy of Pediatrics since the 1950s, and we've got about 200 members. So in terms of some of this transdisciplinary work, it's really tough. We've got huge sections on nutrition. We've got a huge section on um, infectious diseases and all. So there are places to find links um, with um, professional societies in medicine, but it's hard to, to drag them into the interdisciplinary space. Now, the one place where I would argue that there's very clear overlap between human health and soil science and soil health um, is climate change. And since climate change is um, the biggest problem facing us today, and certainly the most important health issue today, um, I want to spend the remainder of my time uh, talking about 
uh, where the overlap is between um, the human health aspects of climate change and, um, and soil health. So um, watch this diagram evolve. I want to thank the CDC for this diagram. I certainly didn't create it. Um, the central circle represents the most significant climate change impacts, uh, rising temperature, more extreme weather, uh, rising sea level, increases in CO2. Um, and then the next ring shows some of the impacts of those changes. And then the outermost part, um, the, the colored wedges, if you will, um, show some of the impacts on uh, human health. So I'll let you just sort of watch that evolve again. And then, oh good, it worked. Um, I've taken the liberty of, uh, with Steve Schaefer's help, um, working to think about where um, soil sciences could come in in this um, CDC um, diagram. And those golden starbursts uh, indicate some of those issues. Oh, okay. Hmm, what do you see? We see the one after that. Oh, that's, that's weird. Okay. Okay, except now all my notes are gone. Uh, okay. So, um, all right. Do what you did. Yeah. Here. Give us the... All right. We tried technology. What can I say? Um, so um, I think you know, air pollution um, impacts the development of the lungs and the human being, um, and of course, when soils erode, um, that contributes to um, air pollution. Um, one of the things that um, has been most fascinating and a little distressing um, about what has already occurred in terms of climate change um, is the change in allergen patterns, um, both uh, the, the timing and the allergenicity of um, pollens that come from some plants. And so again, um, what's growing from the soil and how does that contribute um, to what the plant produces. Um, soils have a tremendous impact on water quality, um, and we know that climate change is influencing um, water quality. We have more algal blooms. Um, we know when it rains, um, uh, gastrointe gastrointestinal infections um, increase. And we've obviously got a lot more rain these days. Um, uh, clearly, um, uh, not maybe so much today, but over the longer term, as we see um, climate change increasing, um, the, the nutritional quality of foods um, are going to change. And um, finally, as um, we get into a situation with uh, the lack of availability of water um, and decreased availability of food, um, we're going to see um, conflicts and climate migration. Um, and we don't deal very well with migrations in this world today. As we know from the crisis in Europe and our own country, um, it's only going to get worse with time. So let me see if I can move back then to... Um, okay. All right, so we're going to be off a slide for here on out, okay. So in terms of kids, one of the issues that um, is very important um, is first of all, we 
think about childhood, you know, starting with impacts on the health of the human beings who will become the mother or father of that child. Um, what are the things that impact on their health? Then we think about the, the child in utero and what impacts on their health. And then, of course, um, we think about um, kids after they're born and when does childhood end? Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, some people never grow up. Um, the usual answer is about 21. Um, in reality, um, the frontal lobes don't finish um, their myelination until about age 25. That's why 20-year-olds do so many stupid things. Um, but so is 25 the end of childhood? I don't you know, whatever. But I think the most important concept is that kids are not little adults. And you can't extrapolate what you know um, of adults down to kids. Kids behave differently. Kids think differently. Um, you know, a kid in a yard is putting their dirt in the mouth. The adults are walking across the yard with shoes on. It's a very different experience, even though the kids and the adults are in the same environment. Um, there are a lot of ways that um, we see climate change impacting on human health. I've alluded to some of them, um, but this slide uh, gives you some more information. Um, and again, issues related to water, air, soil, infectious diseases, um, behavior. Probably the single most important impact of climate change on human health is on behavior. Um, these severe weather events um, create huge psychological problems for kids. Um, when in other parts of the world where food shortages are already an issue, that's a severe um, psychological impact on children. Um, so when water is scarce, Again, that's a severe psychological impact on kids. So mental health issues are of supreme um, importance. Um, children bear a disproportionate um, uh, component of environmentally mediated disease. The World Health Organization um, estimates that about 88% of um, the impact of climate change on human health is borne by children. And of course, um, in turn, this is both in the developed world and in the developing world. And of course, children are also the most vulnerable to under and malnutrition um, that can be traced to poor crop, poor crop, crop yields and uh, poor crop quality. Um, so, uh, Dr. Ziska um, is known to many of you, and um, he's um, done some really amazing research about uh, climate change and human health, and his work shows that we are seeing increased ragweed pollen counts as a result of first later frosts and longer numbers of frost-free days. Um, and for those of you who have allergies, or for me as a physician treating people with allergies and allergic diseases, um, this issue is extremely important, and we see the impact of these situations here, even in the metropolitan Washington, D.C. Uh, area today. Um, also, um, it's been documented that the, the allergy seasons have changed, particularly in the, as you move north um, in the United States and into the southern tier of Canada, um, allergy seasons have become much longer. Um, infectious diseases are an important component of climate change. Um, probably um, one of the most familiar issues has been um, the migration of the range for, um, uh, for um, the L. scapularis uh, uh, tick 
and um, the disease that's carried by that tick. And what you can see is that the southern range hasn't changed over time, but over time the um, infection is more prominent in the north. Um, climate change impacts directly on food security, um, in particular um, by influencing uh, soil quality and some of the uh, most degraded soils occur where climate change um, it poses the biggest threat, so in Africa, um, Latin America, and whatnot. Um, and the most recent IPCC report, IPPC report that you've been reading about in the newspapers, if nowhere else, um, indicates that we need to be on a crash course to lower CO2 levels, and of course, um, the soil system can remove excess CO2. Um, there's uh, a lot to be thought about in terms of human nutrition and um, the decline in soil quality um, is going to impact on the quality of the food crops that are um, developed. The American Academy of Pediatrics has been thinking about climate change since 2007. There is now an organization of many medical societies and affiliated groups, um, the um, Medical Society Consortium on Climate Change. And I would ask you all if there's a soil science organization that might want to consider becoming an affiliate member um, of this consortium, I would refer you to the consortium's website and their consensus statement. And if a soil science organization feels that it would agree with what's in that um, consensus statement about climate change and the impact of climate change on human health, um, then you could become an affiliate member and be part of this discussion. And I'll give you the remainder of the time for questions. <laughs>